Acts chapter 12 is where we find ourselves today, continuing on in our study. And in Acts chapter 12, well, we see a lot of stuff happening. In fact, I, I put a title on today's message, Persecution, Prayer, and Parasites. Yes, we will see all, of the, all three of those things take place within this chapter. Uh, in fact, let me, uh, uh, let, me, let me read out the first five verses here to you. Um, four verses. I'll read the first four verses to you, and we'll dive in. It says, now, at that time, Herod the king, he stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. And now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, and he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. And so, Father, as we, uh, once again, as we open up your word, I pray that you would uh, anoint me with your Holy Spirit, that you'd be upon me with power, uh, and that you would um, bring forth the spiritual gifts that are needed here to teach your people. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, lead us and guide us, and that you would um, prompt the attention of our heart and mind so that we might receive from you today. We ask this by faith in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, so persecution, prayer, and parasites. Um, in Acts chapter 12, as we've gotten this far in our study, we, we get here to this chapter, and this chapter is often labeled as a parenthetical chapter. Uh, in other words, it is one of those chapters that, that, that kind of pulls away the curtains, if you will, of some things that are already taking place in a previous chapter here, chapter 11, and we get a look in behind this, the scenes there, if you will. We get further details to stuff that is happening simultaneously. And in this particular case, what we're dealing with, right as we're opening these up, these first four verses here, what we're dealing with is the persecution of the church leadership in Jerusalem. It is still going on, and it's taken a little bit different shape here in this. And we have seen here in verse number one, we saw that, that Herod, he stretched out his hand to do something, to harass from the church, to harass the church leadership. And he ends up killing somebody. He kills, he kills James. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. He, he actually ends up beheading James in all of this. And so this is the framework of how chapter 12 opens up. This is the parenthetical chapter. It's giving additional information, additional insight. It, it, it's adding that amplification of stuff that is going on. And so... Uh, as we begin this, this chapter, I think it's important that you and I, that we understand the political structure in first century Judea, that, 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 that Jerusalem was under the pressure of the Roman Empire and the leadership of what they had across Rome. It was there. And the harassment of the church was having an impact specifically in Jerusalem uh, because of the Herodian family. There was the dynasty of Herod uh, that was ruling. We knew that, that Herod the Great was on the scene before Jesus was actually born, and we knew that, uh, that, that his sons have continued even up to after Jesus is gone and up through this moment here, quite frankly. And uh, by show of hands, does anybody come here on Wednesday night for the Genesis study? Raise your hand if you are. Oh, a number of you are here. Okay, so you would be happy to know this, that when it comes to the dynasty of Herod, that, that, that these guys, that this lineage, if you will, they're Edomites. You remember in Genesis that we have, uh, we've got Jacob and his, his twin brother is? Esau. That he is the father of the Edomites. So, so, so remember, uh, in Jacob, we have a faith lineage. In Esau, we have a flesh lineage, right? Okay, well, the dynasty that is coming down underneath of the dynasty of Herod, these guys are Edomites. They're from Esau, if you will. That's, that's their, their time. And, and why the New Testament, it talks about, it gives us six different Herods. It can be uh, quite confusing, quite frankly, as we read through it. Let me just highlight four of them here. I think they'll flash them on the screen here for us today. So Herod the Great, I think we all know that. And I think, I think many times when we read in the New Testament, Herod, we just assume, well, it's Herod the Great. Well, that's not true. It's not true in this chapter. And so Herod the Great, who was he? Well, he was the king of Judea. Uh, and what was he, you know, what, what did he do to the church? Remember, he got, um, you know, the, uh, he, he got the inclination that, wait a minute, there's a king that is being born. What's going on? Talk to me, wise men. What's happening here and all this stuff? And as we read through the Gospels, we find that Herod the Great, he killed the baby boys in Bethlehem under two years old, right? He was trying to put that threat to, to rest there, if you will. There, there would be no other king that's coming in. And, and man, he was, he was hungry 
Uh, he had blood on his hands and he had a heart, no doubt, filled with murder. Well, we go on beyond Herod the Great and we get to Herod Antipas. And this is his son number one. Now, what he did is he also ruled, but he ruled in the Galilean region. And he ruled from the, you know, the western side of the Sea of Galilee. That was kind of his territory that he would take on there. And, and, and what do we know about Antipas? Well, Herod Antipas. We know that he ordered the beheading of John the Baptist. And there's a reason why the beheading happened. And I'll explain that here shortly. Um, then we go on down to Herod Philip. This is son number two. Uh, maybe you will remember, uh, for those of you that, that have been to Israel and the rest of you that read your New Testament, you will remember Caesarea Philippi. This is up north. This is at the, at the base of Mount Hermon and all of this stuff. Well, um, Herod Philip, again, son number two, he's the guy that ruled from the northern tip there and he would come down and he would be on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the Golan Heights area, that he ruled in that area. Now we get down to the fourth one, and this is the final one that I'll mention here today, is that we get to Herod Agrippa number one. Now he is the guy that we're talking about here in Acts chapter 12. Now Herod Agrippa one, that this is the grandson of Herod the Great. And he ruled over Judea from AD 41 to 44. So three short years he was there. This is the guy that we're reading about here in verse number two that he beheaded, he killed James. This is the guy. This is the one that is doing that. And so... Um, in Jerusalem, what was taking place? Uh, the church was ministering to hurting people. We saw uh, even through the hands of Peter at the birth of the church that there were those people in the, in the coming days that were healed. And we saw the struggle there, that there was hungry people to know God. And, and the church, at the birth of the church, you got 3,000 people that come and then you get a few more thousand that are added to the church and everything right there in Jerusalem. Listen, uh, the, the church was lifting that weight of, of, of oppression over the common people. And, and, and all of a sudden, people became hungry for Jesus. And they were coming to a right understanding of, of how God's grace was working in their life, in the moment, and God's plan. As, as the disciples shared, as the apostles shared, I should say, they, they spoke very specifically regarding Jesus and his coming kingdom and all of that. And there was a fresh excitement that was happening. It should be the same excitement, gang, that happens within our churches today, from the pulpit to the pew to the parking lot to me and you. There it is. I just made that up. That rhymes or something. So whatever. But, 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 but there should be an excitement. And I don't want you to miss a walk, walk of faith here today. And, and uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan to talk about, uh, you know, bombs bursting in air over there in Israel. But I do want you to understand that a life of faith cannot discount what's happening over there because Israel, again, second time, Israel is God's timepiece for what goes on in the end days. It should be something that the church should be dialed into. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing people in the church turn away from Israel. This is not the time to turn away from Israel. Again, I don't know what your sentiments are towards Israel, but if you get caught up in the hype of Satan and you start falling behind the Palestinian bus and all the stuff that is going on, you're going you're gonna to move into this anti, uh, uh, I just lost the word. What's it called? Anti-Semitic. That's the word right there. You're going to move into an area that God doesn't want you to be in. We're to keep our hands off of that, but we are to understand that God is up to something and he has shared something with us. And... When it comes to leaders, like the dynasty of Herod, all the different leaders that come forward, or it comes to our particular time. Listen, there are good leaders, there are bad leaders, there are absolutely terrible leaders. And we know that just by reading the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's some leaders that they made it super hard for the people to do the daily life, the difficulties of what was in place in taxation and the, and, and the religious persecutions and the struggles that are there, that the average person was oppressed because of policies. Old Testament, New Testament, oh yeah. And in your testament, in 2024, the same thing is happening on the surface here right now. And we can talk about these things with biblical authority and not moving into a political vein for one reason and one reason only. Take a look at the screen here. Let's do this. Let's see this together here. Ecclesiastes chapter one says this. Um, Solomon writing. He says, history merely repeats itself. Is there any question about that? No. I think it's pretty easy to see that. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. 
So in that framework of leadership, Old Testament, New Testament, or right now in 2024, there are good leaders, there are bad leaders, there are terrible leaders. All of those things are true. And as it pertains to the church, and you and I here this morning, we're looking at Acts chapter 12, and the very first idea that we're coming out of the gate with is this, is persecution. Persecution. Let me give you verse 2, 3, and 4 one more time. It says, then... Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further to seize Peter also. This is the scene that we're moving into. This is the stuff that's happening. And he tried to to destroy the church leadership in Jerusalem. Now, as we turn things back around to our lives, we can understand the battle. We can understand that there's a spiritual battle that is going on. And it's just as dangerous today as it was back in first century Christianity Because what does Satan like to do? Satan wants to come in. He wants to disrupt the forward progress within our churches. We have seen, if if you've been at this fellowship long enough, if you've been here for longer than a year, you've probably seen the pulsing forward and the the struggle uh, to regain balance and even the press back that happens. And and guess what? It's not just in a one-year cycle. This is an ongoing battle that goes on. And there's a lot of battles that go on right here within the sanctuary. You know, as, as it's been said over the course of time, it is, it is the people in the audience, it's the people in the pews that preach 50% of the message. Because if you're antagonistic to God as you sit within your chairs, as the, world, as the word is heralded, as the word is taught, as the word is, is preached to you over the top of you here this morning, you disrupt the flow of that because you're pushing off of it. And remember why Jesus couldn't do many mighty works, even in his own town his own hometown of, of Nazareth, is, is because it was doubt, is because of unbelief, is because of all of those things. And those things surface in church gang. They still happen here in 2024. And Satan is the culprit that is behind this because he wants to thwart our, our forward progress in the church. Satan also likes to do this. He stirs up fights in the family of faith. We know that, that, that Paul spoke very specifically to those that were in Corinth. And he says, listen, don't be ignorant of this. Understand what the tactic of Satan is, and that happens right here, right here. Look to the person on your left and on your right. Just kind of just go like that, okay? Yeah, Uh uh-huh, the people that are sitting right there. There's a spiritual battle that is going on. The scripture is clear. It's not against flesh and blood, not at all. And Satan loves to get in there, and he loves to get behind what we see with our natural eye to mess with us. Satan also tries to do this. See how this resonates within your heart. See See if you see the truth of this within your life. Satan comes in and he tries to wear us out and he tries to frustrate us. Have you ever seen that within your life before? Absolutely. If you're having an impact for for Christ, uh, you know, if you're living the Christian life as it was to be meant, then you are going to have opposition that rises against you. And I would speak to you personally here. You know, as a uh, as a pastor, it has been my aim for this last decade, or, or really since the inception of this church, uh, I don't come and, and, and stand behind a, either a table or a pulpit on a stage or on the floor, wherever it is. I don't stand before you, you know, with, with, this, with this attitude that I have everything together and that I'm so polished to give this message. Nope, I don't stand before you. I, I come up here prepared. I know what God's word has to say. I've studied God's word. I've been in prayer both for you and for myself in, in the sense of, of wanting God to do something with us in this moment. Yes, 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 and amen. But I don't stand before you with, with, you know, with the best speech and all of these things, but I do come to you in the power of God's Holy Spirit to give you truth that is necessary for your life. And when these truths, the truths of God are received, your life and my life is changed. We're changed. But it's not like I get one little drink of, of water from the Holy Spirit hose, if that's the right word, okay? You know, and, and then everything is good. I just go about my business and, and all that stuff. Yes, I'm a new creation in Christ, but I must nurture the inner man. I must nurture what God is up to. God is walking me through sanctification. And I can't just sit back on what my life was, my Christian walk was last week, last month, last year, or 10 years ago. It doesn't work that way. We, we, we walk with God on a regular and a daily basis and, and, as your pastor, I, 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 I stand before you, not in a perfect way, but I stand before you when I'm worn out. I stand before you when I'm frustrated. I stand before you with all my frailties. And I stand before you knowing and hoping that God is on my side and that he will see me through the struggles the same way he's going to see you through your struggles. Unfortunately, the bad thing about being a pastor is, is it's been said this way over the centuries, is that pastors die weekly, naked, before an audience of people. Not, 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 not like, like I'm going to have clothes on, but, but like emotionally naked, if you could understand that. 
it's hard to stand here before. Some days I don't feel like standing before you. you know, some days I'll hit one service out of the park and the other one is like, oh, crashing and burned. Uh, Jeff, are you sure you know, did God really call you to this? Listen, I have those questions in my mind. It's terrible. But Satan loves to get in there and he loves to wear us out and he loves to frustrate us. What else do we know? That Satan attacks our bodies. And he does that when he can't break our mind. When, when we continue to retain a hope in God, he comes against us in a way and God allows him to do this to mess with our bodies. Right, we read this in Job's life, don't we? And we see the suffering of the apostles in the New Testament as well because they would not renounce Christ. And these are some very real ways. These are real, real battles that are still happening today. But can I remind you of a couple pieces of good news as we go forward as they adjust the air conditioner a little because it's warm? <laughs> Let's take a look at Psalm 103 for just a second. Just a few verses here on this, okay? Here we go. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 13, it says this, NLT, it's the Lord is like a father to his children. Can you receive that? Can you just like, yeah, man, I need that. He's tender and he's compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. That our God understands and he knows us. He understands our condition. He understands the frailty of us. And I, and I just so love that about the Lord. Look at verse 17 and 18 also. Same Psalm. It says this. It says, but the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. Listen, the authenticity or the genuineness of living the spiritual life, it is contagious. And you can't pass down to your family, to your spouse, to your kids, something that you don't have. You cannot pretend to be a Christian and think that this is going to carry on because it doesn't transfer to anybody else. If you're a Christian, God's already, he's already talked about this thing and what his people is and what, what he does. It passes down. And sometimes when things aren't, aren't passing down, you gotta stop, pause, and go, wait a minute, God, am I, I, I you know, have, have I fallen into a place here to where, where I've lost authenticity with you? Have I lost the genuineness of my heart? The early church... They were in a fight, and the fight was real. And they were having a real impact upon Jerusalem. And the leadership of the church was really making great impacts, and people were coming to faith. And in the New Testament, as we continue on in, uh, in Acts 12 here, we should understand that there are, uh, there are a few different people in here. We're, we're seeing this. In verse number two, we're seeing, it says, then he killed James. It's the brother of John. But for the casual reader, we're going to see James here in verse 2. We're going to go ahead in, in verse number 17. We're going to see James again. And we can go, wait a minute. I knew the Bible was wrong because they just killed him in verse 2. And now all of a sudden they're going up to his house. Uh, go, go tell him, go tell James these things. It's like, okay, well, what is this? Well, it's just like with Herod. Right? We must understand that, that, okay, the dynasty of Herod, it unfolded with six different people, four of the primary ones that we see in the New Testament. But when it comes to James, we'll throw these on the screen for you too. There are three men by the name of James in the New Testament, at least that we read about here. Number one is the one that's being beheaded right here. This is James, the brother of John. Uh, maybe you remember them as the sons of thunder as Jesus referred to them. This is, this is the guy that's, that's being beheaded right here. Uh, we also have uh, in, in verse number 17, okay, we're, we're seeing uh, that Peter says, hey, go and tell these things to James and to the brethren. Now, this James, this is the James, this is the half-brother of Jesus, okay? This is the James that, that doubted Jesus in his earthly years of ministry and all that stuff. And it wasn't until the resurrection of Christ that Paul tells us, that, that, that James comes into this place and begins to believe in Jesus. And now he's like a leader within the church. He was, you know, he, he held a, a pretty, influ pretty good influence in the church. So that's the second one. The third James is, is James, the son of Alphaeus. And we're not talking about him today. So all that to be said uh, is that just understand that there's a few different Jameses here as we navigate through this chapter and in the New Testament in general. Uh, now let's further understand this. Uh, because we see a beheading that is happening right here. Let's understand why John the Baptist got beheaded. Let's understand why James was beheaded right here. 
Now, the Jews had four different methods of capital punishment. They would stone you, they would burn you, they would behead you, or there would be a strangulation. All of them, that's all pretty gruesome. That's all no bueno there. You don't want to be go, go that way. But, but the reason that they would behead you and the reason that they beheaded James right here is for this. They reserved that for anybody that they thought or believed was pulling people in to a false faith. So if you were pulling somebody into a false faith, what they wanted to do is they, 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 would, they would cut your head off. And now James, uh, what did he do? He was telling people about Jesus. Well, what do we know about the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, the religious side of that? Well, they had just got done crucifying Christ, right? A short time earlier here. And, and, and now they're going after all the apostles and everything to try to cut the head off, if you will. And this is why the beheadings were happening. This was specifically the reason that they would behead. And so Herod, again, verse two, verse three, uh, verse four, uh, Herod, he sees that, okay, man, when I did this to James, the Jews, they got pretty excited about that. The religious Jews, they got really excited about it. And so we know this about the beheading of James, that it was done purely in a political capacity to silence the church. But they didn't silence the church. In fact, what, the, what ends up happening is, is that they, in, they inspired the church and as it inspired the church, right, we, we, we see this played out because Peter is quickly arrested. Now, in your Bible, if you look out there, you, you can see here that at the end of verse number three, it says, now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, we can read that and we can get lost. But if I use the phrase Passover as at the end of verse number four, suddenly I can put those things together. I go, oh, wait a minute. Okay, unleavened bread. Oh, he's talking about the Passover. Well, during this time of the Passover here, while they arrested Peter, they wouldn't do any public killings of that was happening. How kind of them not to kill during the Passover, okay? And so, so all that to say is, is that they held him. Peter already had his senses. He was going the way that James was going. And the church got involved. And, and, and as the church got involved, notice with me verse number four one more time. Um, that we see that there were four squads of soldiers um, that were around him. Um, and, and, and so let's, let's understand what that looks like. That there's four squads, and then within each one of those squads, there's four men. So we got a total of 16 men. Now, 16 guards are guarding Peter here. And, and this is how it happened. In the jail cell there in, in Jerusalem, um, they would rotate these shifts about every six hours to keep the guards fresh. And on the right side and on the left side, there would be a guard and a guard, and, and, and Peter was chained to one of those guards. In that same exact room, there would also be two other guards just standing there watching the room. Nobody come in here, okay? On the outside of those gates, it moves into a whole different area. They're not talking about those, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an immediate gate, and then there's the outer gate of the prison, which there's more guards at. The only focus at this point is really just those on those that are attached to Peter and that are specifically in the room looking at him for six hours and then it rotates to another fresh guard and it just, it keeps going. So 24 seven, that was the deal that was going on with him. And they were doing this to persecute the leaders to shut down the church. And we come to our second idea here and this is prayer. Follow along as I read verse number five down through 19. It says that Peter was there for he was kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod uh, was about to bring him out, the night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by, and light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And then the angel said to him, gird yourself up and tie on your sandals. And you notice the practicality of what the angel is doing. Yeah, the, God's dispatched an angel to go in there. And as the angel goes in there, there's still the very practical side of what the angel was doing. We know that, the, that, that uh, according to Hebrews, that angels are ministering spirits that are sent forth to help us as the children of God. Man, I love that. And so that's a very real thing, right? I know our world gets caught up in angelology and all that stuff, but, but, but you really have like an angel that is assigned to you. I, and I don't know exactly all the details of how that works, but I find it fascinating to see what's going on with Peter right here. So his angel says, listen, he says, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And, and he said to him, he says, put on your garment and follow me. And so 
uh, he went out and, and he followed the angel and he did not know uh, what was done by the angel. He didn't know that it was real, but he thought that he was seeing a vision. And, and when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and they went down one street and immediately the angels departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, he says, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. And so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, uh, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda, she came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter, that he stood before the gate. So dude just got out of jail. Rhoda's there. Bless her heart. She's, she's pumped and excited. Peter's out there. Peter's out there. Listen, this guy just escaped from prison. Can we put it that way? Don't leave him standing in the streets. <clears throat> but but this, is, this is just fascinating. And it's just repeated within the, the, the framework of scriptures. Right, because you remember at the time of the resurrection, the morning of the resurrection, right, that, that there were so many women that were around Jesus on the cross, and then there was a handful of them that showed up uh, at the tomb on resurrection morning, and then, and then they're instructed by an angel to go and tell uh, the, the, the rest of the disciples as to what they saw, and, and, and as, as they're going to tell, you know, they didn't believe him. Well, the same thing is happening here. Verse 16, it says, now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, and they saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, and go and tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and he went to another place. And then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and he stayed there. You know, maybe just sprinkling in a little something right here as, as it pertains to these guards. That he examined them and then he put them to death. You know, at that particular time in Rome, that, that, that the guard, whoever was guarding a prisoner, if that prisoner got away, escaped or whatever, that that guard would receive the same punishment that was destined for that prisoner. And this is why these guys were killed. They were put to death. And what do we, what do we know uh, about the church in this, in these verses? Well, the first thing that the church did, the way that they responded to the persecution, James is beheaded, Peter's locked up, his day is coming. As soon as Passover is over, they're taking his head as well. He's in his last 24 hours. This is, is perhaps his last night of sleep right here. And if, and, and if you notice how Peter was at that last night of sleep, that the angel had to strike him on the side and say, hey, get up. Peter is fast asleep. This is his last night. He knows what's coming on the next day. He already knows what took place with James, and he knows what's coming as soon as Passover ends here the next day. He's chained between two guards. All of this attention is on him. He's under this wave of persecution, and there he is, secure within his faith, and he's sleeping right there on the bed. I, I have to tell you this. I, I, I don't down Peter, man. I envy Peter. I want that. When, when, when my life is being persecuted and the bottom has just fallen out of it, the wheels have fallen off, I'm on the shoulder of, of my Christian life just limping around, I want that same type of peace. Now, Peter didn't always get this right. In fact, I think I identify um, a lot with Peter because he often opened his mouth and shoved his foot in and said the wrong thing and did the wrong thing. I feel like Peter a lot of the times. But there's also these times where, 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 man, Peter, his exemplary faith, and this is, this is one of those moments, man. He's sleeping at peace the night before, you know, he's, he's, he's going to die. So I want us to understand this, what the church did. The church, they started praying, and they did not stop. We can know this. First Thessalonians chapter 5 on the screen here says this. Never stop praying. Any confusion about that, by the way? That's pretty straightforward. He goes on to the next verse. He says, be thankful in all things, not for all things, but be, be thankful in all circumstances. I think Peter was, he was chilled. He says, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So we never stop praying. We understand that the circumstances that come into our life, that they are allowed by God. Now, we're not talking about the foolish, foolish sinful decisions of us walking away from God. But what we're talking about is, is that as we're living the Christian life, 
not as perfect people, but as people just following Jesus, that God allows hardships into our life. And those hardships are meant to test our faith, to try our faith, to enlarge the borders of our heart. They're designed to do something. And, and as we're seeing here with Peter, uh, think back with me, if you will, for just a few moments. You know, over these past several weeks, we've traveled through Acts 9, 10, 11. Here we are at chapter 12. And, w- and when we think about the things that have taken place in those chapters, at the end of Acts chapter 9, we found that Peter that, that, you know, he was, he was called out and he goes down to Lydda. Uh, and, 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 and in Lydda, he ends up healing a guy that had been bedridden for eight years. And the word gets around that town and it spreads even farther and, and goes up to, to Joppa. And, and, and then in Joppa, you know, the people hear what's going on. Oh yeah, Peter's down there. Get him up here. And so he goes over to, to Joppa. And at Joppa, he raises Tabitha or Dorcas, uh, same person. He raises her. She had died. And he ends up raising her up, doing exactly what he saw Jesus do. And in Acts chapter 10, it goes farther. Because Peter, he takes the gospel message right there from Joppa, and he responds again to an angel ministering to him. And he goes up a little bit farther, taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And, 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 and what do we see? We see the expansion of ministry that is going on. He's being a very fruitful man. God is using him powerfully. And when when all of that ministry is done there, now he returns, Acts chapter 11, now he returned to Jerusalem. And what was the first thing that happened from his fellow Christian Jews at that point? Acts 11, what we saw last week is, is that immediately they criticized him. How could you do that? How could you go into the house of the Gentile? Listen, bro, I took six dudes with me to witness. The angel told me to go, and here's the result of what happened. It was incredibly fruitful in all that. And that criticism, now on the backside of that criticism is Acts chapter 12. This is what we're in the middle of. All of this stuff has been here in Peter's life, that we've seen the good, we've seen the fruitfulness, we've seen the amazing, miraculous works, and, and, and we've also seen here, James beheaded, Peter is spared, but man, the, 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 the church kicks into action, and this should, this should take place within our fellowships, within our, our churches here that right now our pastors are getting their tails whipped because of all of the opposition that just comes against our pastors. Right now, Satan is targeted in in special ways. And by way of extension, you as a Christian, you know, Satan's after you as well. But but the method or or, or the steps of the church should be regular praying. Uh, Just today, um, it happened here in between services uh, that there, there's somebody that, that, uh, that approached me here and says, listen, I was praying for you in first service. I was praying. And they weren't even here on site, but they, they told me they were praying for me. I want to tell you what that means to me. Not in a way like, oh, thank you so much for praying for me. I don't mean it like that. I mean seriously. I grab hold of that. You become my next best friend if you tell me you're praying for me. Why? Because I need your prayers. Because this is a supernatural work, that the, that the effectiveness of this work only happens because of, of, of you asking God and the grace of God working in my life, working through my life, and working through your life as well. We need God. We need to understand that, that prayer is not just something we do because, well, you know, I, I just, I understand that I'm supposed to do that. No, 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 no. When we lock shields, when we lock arms together, when we go forward together, we understand that it is prayer, 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 prayer. And you can always tell when somebody is praying for you. You know how? Nobody? Anybody know how? Anybody know how you can tell somebody's praying for you? Their hands are folded. No, not really. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give them a prop here. I wasn't giving it away. Good guess. <laughs> I'm praying for Doug right now. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm not. I stopped praying. Now I am. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the way that they talk to you. The sensitivity in their conversation with you. I can always tell. Remember what we read, you know, a week ago, how much criticism came forward. And I know, I know the person that comes up to me, not the person, but, but it's really by way of extension people. Uh, but the individual that comes up to me, there's the right word. When they have the look in the eye, and the first words out of their mouth is criticism, all of these types of things, you know the person's not praying for you. You know. And we need to have such a warm, open embrace. And maybe, not as, maybe it's not a, a set written schedule, if you will, that you go through prayer. But you know, here's the, here's the indicator of when you should pray. When the, when the individual is brought to your mind, there's the, there's the moment that you pray for the individual right there. 
And we're always in this place about just being receptive to what God is up to. And just randomly, sometimes, you know, a name will pop into your head. And maybe it's maybe somebody here at church, maybe somebody in your family, maybe it's, you know, somebody you have interaction with, but God brings the individual to your mind. It's like, oh, that's weird. I ain't thought about that person forever. Well, when you say, I ain't thought about that person in forever, that's, listen, this is your cue. God is bringing somebody to your remembrance right there that you would pray for them. And you may not know what to ask for right now. Well, that's okay. God makes intercessions through groaning right through you. The Holy Spirit makes intercessions with groaning. So just go, oh, Lord, I, <laughs> that person wearies me. And you just groan, and God knows what you mean, okay? <laughs> Don't mistake that as a grunt for getting older, okay? No, that's a little different. But God, God was at work for Peter, and the church was praying. Psalm 91, 11, you'll see it on the screen here. Uh, just another powerful truth for you and I to hang on to. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. You want to you promise and you want to see it in action? Acts chapter 12, you see it in action. You want to promise for yourself? Take a look at it right there. Man. We also know this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that angels are sent to care for the people who will inherit salvation. And what's the application of all of that? I find the application to be absolutely exhilarating, practical too. And that is, is that we are invincible in the plan of God until he's done with us. Did you hear that? That is, I mean, what a crazy statement. How can you say that, Pastor? We are invincible in the plan of God until he's done with us. And even when God has to do miraculous things to keep us alive, like here with Peter in this situation, if it's according to his plan, he's going to do it. <clears throat> I've stood before you over these last six, seven months, and I've told you of the craziness that has gone on within um, the framework of uh, uh, my home, my marriage, my wife, you know, two different bouts of cancer, and then um, and then the, uh, you know, just an afternoon where psh, blindness f uh, fell on her left eye. That's why she's walking around with a patch out here and the emergency surgery that happened. And then, um, you know, they saw that it was going to happen in the other eye. And so she was, you know, she's um, face down on the couch, blind in two eyes for, you know, like a week there. Still can't see out of the left eye. Hopefully in the next three weeks or so that'll come back, Lord willing. But through the staggering aspects of war walking through the impact and the implications of, of health challenges, uh, my wife, Jody, she often tells me, um, I, I, I don't really perceive myself this way, but this is how she perceives me. She says, you know, you would still go up there and stand on that stage and minister to people if your arm was falling off and you couldn't see them, and you had the limp to get up there. She tells me these things. She says, but you know, Satan's got your number because he sees when he hits me and I'm impacted, it slows you down and messes you up. This is what she's saying. This is not the first time that she said this. She's, she's, she's said this uh, probably for a number of years, but in more recent months, in more recent days, um, you know, I've, I've tasted the reality of these types of things. And in my family, in my marriage and in my family, we have um, agreed within our hearts to come to this place to realize that whether any one member within the family, no matter what happens, that the mission of Jesus Christ is to go forward. If I end up as a man that has to bury my wife early, or if my wife has to bury me early, or if our children go before us, we understand that the mission goes on. It is within our heart that the mission goes on. The role, the function, the details of how that, that plays out, I don't know, I'm not there yet. No. Maybe God will never take us there, and that would be awesome too. But I know this, that at this very second, I've told you, I've shared this with you in, in months gone by, 
um, that one of our uh, early on uh, board members that, that um, remained on the board until just before COVID, uh, Joey McKee out of uh, Calvary Chapel, Castle Rock, a dear, dear friend of mine. We came through, uh, you know, Bible school together and all this stuff <clears throat> um, that, you know, a little more than 24 hours ago, they put him on ho- hospice. He's on his final breaths right now because God didn't heal him from his cancer. And it just, bam, it's just taken off throughout his whole body. And within eight, nine months here now, now he's, he's leaving behind a wife and, and two sons and, and multiple grandchildren and all of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, I got, this, I got the news of this last night. Uh, and it's something that, that weighs heavy on the heart. It's like, how do I help? How do I encourage? What do I do? I mean, we've been, you know, all of us have been friends for so long and a few decades. And now, what does this look like? And I see what's going on with James here in the start of this chapter. And I just wonder, you know, how this church felt at that time when their leaders were getting picked off, when the, 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 um, the oppression of the enemy was real. And man, they were, you know, not to go jump Bon Jovi on you, but they were living on a prayer, like literally, because they didn't know exactly what was going to happen to them if they were the next one. And I want to encourage you, sharpen you, Maybe bring to your your senses a greater awareness of what is going on. Listen, if you're a Christian, you're not in the time frame to be messing around with God right now. We don't want to be ashamed of his appearance. So I'm not not stripping away salvation by way of your your performance. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian, okay? But we are warned in the scripture, we're encouraged within the scripture for the believer that we don't want to be ashamed of his appearing that Christ is going to call the church up at any moment, that we're living and we're waiting on the edge of our chair right now. We opened up service today talking about the prophecies that come out of Isaiah about the first coming of Christ. And then I shared with you what Jesus said on the Olivet Discourse to his boys and what Ezekiel 38 shows us, again, adjusting the time frame there, but, but, but the very pointedness about what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ, we, we understand these things are on the, the verge. This stuff is happening right now. The scripture is clear that no man knows the day or the hour at the time at which the church is going to be raptured. But we do know the day and the hour, literally to the day of the second coming of Christ. We know that day. It's labeled in the book of Revelation after the Antichrist comes in, sets down and, and, and declares himself to be God and demands to be worshiped. We understand that it's three and a half years and the day is given. The number of days are given there for the second coming of Christ. For the rapture of the church, we do not know the day or the hour. We know the seasons. We know the times. We know the things, the indications that are happening. And the indications are Israel as the timepiece. And so I, was, I share those things not to scare you. But if it scares you back to the place of getting sober, may you be, may you be in this place of reverential awe of God. God, I'm sorry I've walked away. And let's just be honest. Yeah, I stand here before you as a pastor, but can I tell you that over the course of the past 30, 31, almost 32 years, next month, May, almost 32 years, I've had my bounce with Jesus where I've been so frustrated with God and there's been times where I've withdrawn from being close to the Lord. And so have you. You know that as well. We even read this in the scriptures. We see that even David, King David, fell into a place that he ran from God for a year until Nathan the prophet came to him and said, man, he gives him this little parable, he gives him this story, and he says, you are the man. And so wherever you are, please understand that God is a good father. He's not trying to put a trip upon you, but he wants you to understand. He doesn't want you to be ashamed when the church is called up, the bride of Christ is called up, the rapture of the church happens, and we meet the Lord within there, do you want to be ashamed at that moment? I think you're like me, and the answer would be no. But we wrestle in the reality of what goes on from day to day. I want to encourage you to be courageous. I want to encourage you to keep moving forward. I want to encourage you to continue to, to, to watch the gospel advance within your life and what God is doing through your life. It's scary. I don't know how you felt. I don't know what you thought. I don't even know if you put a thought into it. When you heard yesterday, 24 hours ago, that there was 300 things, 300 rockets that were sent and launched from Iran 
to Israel. I don't know what you thought within your mind. I don't know if you thought, oh man, this is it. This is the war that we don't know. Where is this going to happen in relation to the rapture? Is it before the rapture? Is it after the rapture? The war of, of Ezekiel 38. Gog and Magog with, with, with all of those players coming down. Well, we can stop for a second and we can go, wait a minute. I don't see, I don't see Russia in this one just yet. I don't see where they're at right now. But does that happen? Scholars are divided. They don't know. Nobody knows. Does it happen before or after the rapture of the church? We don't know. But we're in that time frame, folks. We're, it's, like, it's like happening right now before our eyeballs. Absolutely staggering and mind-blowing. And, and I just want to encourage you, again, to keep moving forward. It might not look so pretty. It, you listen, a Christian walk is messy because we're messy. We're sinful. But God's not going to depart from you. So don't renounce the Lord. Draw close to God. Now the chapter closes off. Uh, five verses here. These will be really fast. I'm going to keep my comments very small here. But in the final five verses here, chapter, or, excuse me, uh, verse 20 down through 25, it says it this way. It says, Now Herod had been very angry at the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord and having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, and they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. And so on a set day, Herod, he was arrayed in royal apparel. He sat on the throne and he gave an ordination to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately an angel of the, the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and he died. And that's where the parasite thing comes in. But the word of, of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul, they returned from Jerusalem. And when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Here's the comments that I want to make to you about this. This is in Caesarea Maritima. Anybody in this room been to Israel with me? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Uh, this is a collection of you guys have. <clears throat> You've been to this place. I've taken you here, and I've talked to you about this very thing right there in that theater. But as this chapter closes out here, we, we find that Herod Agrippa I, this is the guy that, it's at the beginning of the chapter, that beheaded uh, James, that arrested uh, Peter and so forth. And we find here at the end that he couldn't find Peter. He killed all the guards that were walking, uh, watching him. And now he bolts down here to this area, to Caesarea. And as he comes down here, we, we read a, a brief description of what took place right here in Acts. But Flavius Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, he provides more context and more details as to what actually went on right here in this. Let me read it to you here. They might flash it on the screen for you. It says that Herod went down to Caesarea and he held, he held some shows and, and some games in honor of the Roman emperor Claudius. And on the second day of these shows, he put on a garment, watch this, made entirely of silver. And in the early morning, he walked into the theater and the rays of the sun struck the silver of his garment, making it shine. And the people of Tyre and Sidon, they stared in amazement and they cried out, he is a God. And they added, be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we from now on own thee as superior to mortal men. So they were saying this to him. The king did not reject their Im, uh, impious flattery. And just then he looked up and Herod saw an owl sitting on a rope, uh, a rope above his head and immediately believe that this was an omen. Suddenly sorry, he started suffering violent pain in his bowels. Herod exclaimed to his friends, your God is all ready to come to his life's end. And he whom you saluted as immoral is going away to die. And the pain increased so severely that he had to be carried hastily into the palace where after five days of torture, he died at the age of 54. These are the details that are filled in from Josephus. And the simple lesson here for you and I as we close this chapter out is that we see a man that persecuted the church and that he began to take glory and God brought a rapid end to that his life. And a simple lesson for you and I is this, 
is that we would not touch the glory of God. When the miraculous things that go on and God uses you for ministry, that you would not touch those things and take credit for those things, but that you would give credit where credit is due, and it's to God. If you see a miracle happen, it's not because of you. It's not because you're lucky. It's not because you're cool. It's not because, you know, you, you know, you know you, you've got the right power. No, 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 it's merely because of God's grace. And God is the one that is doing that. And by way of extension, we, you know, in Calvary Chapel, we often, you know, we, we, we say don't touch the three Gs. Let me give it to the guys first, and then we're going to give the one for the girls, okay? So guys, we don't touch the girls. We don't touch the gold. And we don't touch the glory. Those are the three things that we should understand in the church. The girls are God's, the money is God, and the glory is God. For you girls, there's more girls in this room than there are guys, so this is important for you girls. Don't touch the guys. That's important for you to take that as well. Don't touch the gold, the money's God, and don't touch the glory. It's all the Lord's. May we learn from what happened here to, from Herod Antipas at the end of Acts number 12, how he received that, he received those things. And God says, not so. They held you as a God and they ask you for mercy and there's only one that does that, it's him. God Almighty, do you understand that? Yes. All right, let's call the worship team together, huh?